This message was brought to you by Hustlers University. Sign up today where your real education begins. What's going on, people? Glenn and Cameron with another episode of How to Make a Living Without a Job. Someone said, hey, Glendon, why don't you give advice on how to do X, Y to the Z? And I responded to the person with a playlist of 500 videos that do just that. Then it hit me and it gave me inspiration for this video. Why people aren't successful is they don't know how to fucking think, nor research, nor quantify information. Because I looked at that. So many people will ask questions that if they hit Google and spent 30 seconds, they would have the answer. But I thought about it and I was like, okay, everybody that does this isn't a dumbass. It can't be. What's really going on? Then it hit me. Conditioning. Mental conditioning. You have been mentally conditioned to be a follower. That's why you're always asking questions. Uh, this is extremely prevalent in the black community. That's why so many black folks need a father figure or a mother figure because they don't trust their own abilities. They need that guidance even if they are smarter and more <laughs> successful have greater abilities than the person that they give that father or mother mantle to. I've studied this for years. It cracks me up. It, it totally cracks me up. But one of the things that people don't seem to understand is if you get cookie cutter type situations, you're going to have a problem. And I'm going to give you a real good one because I got a comment this morning. And, you know, I kind of laugh them off because when you make a comment like that, and yeah, I'll give you the comments like, all the people that I know who have money have degrees. And it was like, it must be an Atlanta thing. I haven't looked because I'm driving, but I guarantee you, if you do the national rate on the number of people with degrees and the number of people who don't, it's probably going to be like 68% of the people in this country don't have a degree. And out of that group that does have a degree, you do a simple Google search. I have one degree, two degrees, three degrees, and I'm broke. So I thought about that, and I was like, this is a serious conversation. But there are people that have degrees. And, you know, I also, I'll say it again, and I'll be really, really clear. To go into $100,000 worth of student loan debt for a degree that cannot earn you any money is fucking stupid and fucking foolish. You know, people like to give what I call exceptional situations. If your dad owns the company, he pays for you to go to school to come back and work with the company. You are, you were never a part of the conversation to begin with. Whether you went to school or not, you were going to be okay. See, that, that's the thing that cracks me up. Someone like a Donald Trump who started with 33 million bucks in the 1970s. And for those of you who are a little slow, that's the equivalent of a billion dollars today. He started with a billion. He started with a billion. It's kind of hard to go wrong when you start with that much money. He almost did. But going back to the conditioning, going back to the fact that people are conditioned to not think. Take take this um, thing that happens all the time. Say someone has a degree, a uh, liberal arts degree. Very, you know, It gives you a lot of knowledge about a lot of stuff. You can be a very interesting person to talk to. But what can these people do? Because what has happened is that potential, we're going to hire you based on potential. And some companies still do it. Most don't because they can't afford to. They never really could afford to, but because they were propped up, they did so anyway. Now it's like, hey, you can't contribute. You can't come in and make a difference immediately. We're not going to hire you. You're seeing this on all levels. 
take the uh, quarterback position in the NFL. Used to be a guy would get drafted. They give him three or five years to, to mature. <laughs> Not anymore. Look at the number of guys that were playing college ball last year or two years ago who are starters in the NFL right now. It's like 30%, 40%. Think about it. 30 to 40% of the starters in the NFL were in college two years ago playing ball. Just to give you an example that most organizations, whether it's football, NFL, back, you have to come in and produce. You have to come in and to produce. So if you're getting a degree, basket weaving, 104, and you go apply for that job and they say, hey, we don't need any basket weavers. We need critical thinkers. We need mathematicians. We need scientists. We need doctors. You don't have any of that? And off with your head. And close the door behind you and clean up the blood before you go. So I'm going to give you some insight. Now, I don't have a degree, but I have some critical thinking skills. And this is something that I saw happening because one year I did work for the census and it was very intriguing because I learned a lot. This is the problem in the United States of America right now. Even with, you know, 60 some percent of the people not having degrees and 30 percent, 28, 20, you know, something. I don't know the exact number. The number of jobs that require a degree are streaking in proportion to the number of people being born every day. What that means is we're making people faster than we're making jobs that pay that kind of money. People are not going to stop fucking because the birth rate is still going up even though there's a large segment of American society women aren't having babies. They're not getting married. Well, Hispanics, Asians, Blacks still fucking and having a lot of kids. So, the population is still growing. Another thing, and this was a problem when I worked for the census, because that's one of the reasons they do the census, though. Allocate resources per state. Like, you know, if you don't answer the census form, you could be costing your state money. That's how a lot of this stuff's allocated. So, you got all these people screwing. Then the job, you know, the, let's, let's give it a sweet spot. That, um, that spot of let's say the job starts 8500 grand yeah 8500 those kind of jobs those are the jobs that allow one person to work and with proper budgeting raise a family those jobs are not plentiful in when you compare and contrast to the number of people who have in their population they're very very few now here's the insidious part they're going to disappear faster than any other category of jobs. Why? Automation. Disruptive technology. That's what's happening. So, even if you are currently right now in school preparing for a job, say you did all the right stuff. Say you did the research. Say the job market was looking great. Uh, the outlook from the U.S. Department of labor was saying that you know this field is going to grow wildly then some smart cookie in his mama's basement comes up with a piece of technology something and it goes into the marketplace and within five years eliminates 40 to 50 percent of those jobs not going to happen how many photographers do you see for time magazine citizen photographers citizen journals have replaced paid journalists. This was not something that everyone can do. There was a certain grooming process. God. That's what technology is doing. That's what it has done. And it will continue to do this. It will get to the point and I don't know when this is going to happen, but at some point, your doctor that performs surgery on you, it's not going to cut you open. It's going to be an automated process with a set of parameters, algorithms. You're going to go on the table, robots, knives, do what they need to do. He's going to be in a joystick. He will not even have to be in the operating room. He wouldn't even have to be in the state. He could be in another country and operate on you. Now, what does this do? It gets rid of OR techs. It gets, there'll be people in there because there's going to have to be something there in case of system failure or something. 
There will have to be people there. But when we get to that level, OR techs, uh, operating room nurses, very, very uh, highly paid specialists, they will be disrupted. So say you need a team of 12, 12, 15 people for certain surgeries, uh, three to four for really, or two for really simple procedures. That's all going to go down to one or two people. There will be a program, and this is way off, that it's like, okay, the, the diagnosis is this. Doop, doop, you go on the table, program's going to handle your surgery. Going to do everything, close you up everything. And there will be like doctors, this is coming. This is coming. Just, you know, to let you know, even up on the high end, Doctors will be disrupted, and doctors right now are in short supply because of all the craziness with malpractice insurance. A lot of smart cookies went in other fields. A lot of doctors got out. A lot of doctors retired. So there is a shortage of doctors right now, which is projected to go on for on for a long time. When technology and the intersection of technology meets that, it's going to solve a lot of problems, and there are people working on it now. So if they're working on something as advanced complex as surgery you sitting in an office at a computer is in jeopardy I want you to think about that you sitting in an office at a computer plugging in numbers looking at stat sheets anything that a computer can do or act on do it's a matter of time before it takes your job in the next five years major industries will be disrupted and another issue I have with college is it takes too damn long. You can no longer afford to be in school for five years and only get the formal education and not get any practical education. You can't do that. You have to get both at the same time. I was a business owner and I would never hire anybody with no experience. This shit was too painful. It cut you. You're paying someone to train them which is another part of the conditioning that people expect that. It's like they expect to come into your organization and you to pay them a great wage and for you to train them, to give them skills so they can go ahead and then scum to some other organization for more money. That is an expectation. That's how the game is played. And I got this saying, don't hate the player, don't hate the game, learn the fucking rules so you can win. So everybody's learning the rules and the thing is, employers are learning the rules quicker than you are because they have a vested interest in that so understand you know there's so much evidence I mean major magazines billionaires there's one Peter Thiel I believe his name he's giving people money not to go to school bright people with promises say hey don't go to school take this money and go do this so for those of you out there who are saying oh you know just clean it you are ill-informed. This whole thing is shaping education, and mark my words, with the conversation that's going on in five years, the cost of getting education is going to go down. Because so many people are not going. They're dropping out, student loan problems. It's got to come down for this thing to continue to go on. The only reason tuition continued to go up was student loans. If colleges had to operate on the paradigm of we must guarantee results to keep getting people in, wouldn't be as many colleges and tuition would not be skyrocketing so let's talk about those people who have a degree in their options once again using logic there are so many people with degrees for those few jobs it is it is created salary compression why are you going to give out this wonderful awesome salary when you have not one but 1,000 highly qualified applicants. Not marginal, not okay, but you have 1,000 who can come in and do a great job. Supply and demand, Ec Ecom 101, when the supply is greater than the demand, the price must come down. And the price is your salary. There are some people out there who listen to this, they haven't had a raise in years. And when you factor in the declining value of the dollar, 
their real economic buying power has gone down year after year after year. And they're wondering why they're struggling. It's like, yeah, I actually made more money than I did 10 years ago, but I feel less financial. I'm struggling. You know, every month's a grind. So factor in that. So for those of you who have degrees and you're young, this is my advice to you. And this is going to sound very contrary to a lot of things I said, but I will break that down for you. Get the fuck out of America. Go work in one of these emerging economies and for the following reasons. I traveled a lot. You can live like a king in the Philippines right now, 50 Gs a year. I'm talking balling. I'm talking maid, driver, penthouse, the whole nine yards on 50 Gs a year. Balling. Your money will go... 10 to 20 times further in certain emerging economies. Thailand, um, not, the, not the UK. No, no, no. UK, you're going to pay out the ass. So, if you have skill sets and you have a fresh college degree and you're not married and you don't have any kids, I highly recommend that you get the fuck out of America for two to six years. Now, why do, you, why do, I, why do I say two to six years? Number one, I've lived in Japan for six months. I've been in a lot of places for extended periods of time. As an American, we're conditioned to love this place. You go somewhere, the money can be great. You're living like a king. You are balling. And for a lot of us, that's going to not be enough. You can do it for a few years and come back. Because see, the thing is, you go away and you get that experience and you get that sophistication of being an expat, you're more attractive to people back here now. See, because the thing is now you're experienced. Now you've built something, and you can come back here and play the game better because when they look at those thousand applicants for that $180,000 job, and they're like, okay, yeah, oh, whoa, you've been in Singapore for six years. Let's call this guy in. That identifier, that qualifier, it separates you from the pack have to do things that separate you from the pack. And the reason I'm doing this is because there's a lot of people out there who have a degree and they're trying to hustle and they're not going to make it because they don't have hustleability mindset. Because they've been conditioned to be a worker bee. And if you've been conditioned from the age of 6 until you know, like you're 21, 22, 23, 24, it's hard to get around. So while you're trying to get around that, you need to make some money. So like I said, get the fuck out of America for two to six years. Find yourself a career field that you really want to do, something that's scalable. Go overseas. And also, you do it that young, the experience will just be part. It will be the experience of a lifetime. I can tell you. You'll just see things. You'll do things. Uh, it'll just blow your mind. Now, understand. There are some places that are very much like America, to a point. Like the Philippines, I have a friend that lived there for the last three years. Uh, just moved to Sweden. Rolling blackouts. You don't see them on Facebook, it's because the grid is down for two or three days. So, they're used to it because that's their daily life. As someone who's leaving America, where there's ubiquitous internet access, where, I mean, seriously, the power just doesn't go out unless there's a storm. Even then, it may come right back on. That could just, like, not, you know, that could just uh, drive you a little nuts. Make you a little batty. So, get the fuck out. Yeah. Tell dear old dad, dear old mom, hey, I'm going to do this. Start uh, searching international job bulletin boards. And go out right now today, if you don't have one, and get a passport. Go ahead. You should have one anyway. Go out, file, spend the money, get your passport. Oh, shit! Can you get a passport? Government shutdown! Oh, damn. I didn't think about that. Well, go ahead and try... Well, yeah, you get your passport at the uh, post office. Go go start the process. Damn, that is a bitch. Um, but seriously, get your passport and start thinking about some countries that you wanted to go to. And this is how you do it. Like, a lot of folks don't know this. Like, the tip of Africa is just, like, four hours from Australia. You know, so when you get to certain parts of the world, it's just easier to get other parts. So, say 
you're working in Thailand, Malaysia, somewhere like that, getting to other places is much easier because of the proximity. So you can work someplace and go vacation in Bali on the weekend. That's what a lot of people do. Like uh, the Greek Isles is like the Caribbean for the UK. So just some stuff to think, you know, start, you know, planning. Understand it will be lonely. Understand it'll be a little crazy. But you're young. Get over yourself. Do it. Do it. Because I can go into a room and talk to people. And unless there's someone that lived in another country, I talk about my travel experiences, I blow everyone away. Not too many people have lived in Japan. Not too many people. But you can. You can do something different. And also understand if you do not go to an emerging let me say emerging. This is a place where the grid may go down because it's emerging. If you go to a place that's not emerging, understand you're going to have the same problems that you have here. You know, competition because there's so many people there with a degree or so many people who are qualified. That's the reason. Like, I mean, look, in Europe the last few years, there have been revolts and uprisings in the street because things have changed so much there. So understand. Get the fuck out, get a game plan, and have an, e an entry plan. Once you get that experience, don't disconnect. Stay abreast of what's going on here. And stack your cash. You move somewhere where the standard of living is like really crazy low. You can come back here with 100, 150 grand, 200 grand, and then start your own business. Have some kind of vision. Uh, when I was had my storage auction business, there was this couple. Used to see them about every yeah six to nine months. They were both married, married couple, husband and wife, and they both were Iraqi contractors. When you can still make a grip, I don't think you can make as much as they were making because they were both doing one hundred and seventy-eight thousand a year under thirty, and they would come in and they get stuff. And what they were doing was they go over there, they had a five-year plan, they should be back now, and they were making that money, and they would come back every six to nine months and buy one, one or two houses, cash money, and his goal was, it's like, we do this for five years, and we, we're going to have, you know, 20 to 30 homes, bought, paid for cash, that's our retirement, so for five years, husband and wife, and I, I give them mad credit um, mad props for having that kind of forward thinking because they are they set themselves up for the rest of their lives for five years five years will enable them to live like most of the people they know cannot will never live because they worked overseas for five years so that's what I'm saying two to five years emerging economy it's not going to be glorious. It'll be some fun. It'll be some bullshit. But go. Get your ass out of here. And then, this is the, another reason that I'm so appreciative of America. I've been to other places. You go to other places, and these things that you take for granted will become stark realities. Like, you know, when you flip the light switch on and the lights come on. <laughs> you, you, you take that stuff for granted. It's not like that all over the world. It's not like that. So get your game plan. And, uh, you know, just do it. Go somewhere and do it. Because the thing is, in this new economy, you're going to have to be different than the next guy. Not kind of, sort of, not just marginally different. You will have to be different. Unique with skill sets. Because that's just how tight the competition is. And once you do this, it will also give you more self-confidence. It will help you if you want to start a business. Because I'm coming to another conclusion. You have people who would rather go hungry than start a business. Because it's too hard. I'm sorry. Starving is hard to me. Um, being homeless is hard to me. Just, just my thought process. Yours may be different, but that's my thought process. So, you know, just really learn to think because information that I just gave you in this video, right? 
it's freely available anywhere on the internet that anyone wants to look at it. But due to the mental conditioning, your mind's aperture is closed. That light, that that light that's wrapped up in that knowledge, you can't see it because your aperture is like it's squeezed tightly shut because of the conditioning. You, you cannot even phantom some of the stuff I'm telling you. That's why I don't really get into it with people on comments anymore because if you give me your opinion, which is your right, but I know it to be factually false, to me that makes you a dumbass. Because you could have easily found out that information and a lot of people who leave um, crazy opinions, they just do it to get a rise. And when I ignore them, they're like really pissed off because it's like, you didn't come after me. So understand, the conditioning is deep. You really, really are going to have to learn how to become a critical thinker, how to really put together information, and how to look at stuff. Because I put out a video about eBay a few months ago and I also said some stuff that they were going to do it again. And the thing is, the reason they're going to do it again, eBay does not need as many sellers as they have. Now I know you're going, whoa, 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 whoa. The more sellers they have, the more money they make. Nope. The pool is diluted. You have people undercutting each other. You have people providing poor customer service because they're so desperate to make a sale, to make a buck, that they're doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing, which dilutes and makes the buy, customer's buying experience. And understand, all the bidders on eBay are eBay's customers. They're not yours. So it's really in their best interest to get rid of many small sellers as possible. Because as a large company, even if you're operating on small margins, you just have more resources to provide the better customer experience. And I'm not trying to knock small sellers. I'm just telling you how eBay is thinking. They don't need you. You are a nuisance. So what if you pay 400 bucks a month in eBay fees? They got people paying 30 grand. They rather take 10 of them versus, you know, 100 of you. Easy. So that's another reason the ranks are thinning. They, and they will continue to thin. Um, the period of time where eBay was that wonderful, you know, second business or main business, that's over. It is over. You talk to anyone with years and years of eBay experience at a high level, 100,000, you know, 50,000 to 100,000 a month or more, they're walking away. And if eBay was that great, why are they walking away? You know, people don't walk away from money. They walk away from problems. And eBay's a big, eBay has a big problem. So, understand, you know, you still can use it. You can still make a little money. You can kind of stay under the radar. And that's even another reason that you need to have multiple income streams. And um, a lot of people don't really get that because when you're doing something and you're doing it well, you learn to love it. You look forward to doing it because you understand it. And you have a high degree of confidence in that stuff. So I understand why when you start this, it's very hard for you to let it go. But you, you, you definitely have to understand. You're going to have to be a much critical thinker. Now, I've been meaning to do this video for a long time. And... Uh, because, you know, someone's like, you're so arrogant, you know, you're not humble. I'm going to show you exactly why I'm the, I'm the way I am. I'm going to show you to that neighborhood that I used to live in when I was going through all that shit. Because, you know, I haven't come over here in a long time. This used to be my repository for, you know, when shit was going bad in my life or so I thought. I would just come over here and sit outside the house. And like, you used to live in that fucking room, dude shit ain't that bad and you know for i haven't come here in a long time i think i brought some yeah i did bring someone to look at it you know actually this year but for just coming for renewing faith you know changing perspective hadn't happened in a long time so 
I'm going to show you what I used to live in. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to the house. I don't even know if it's still a boarding house. I don't know what the fuck it is. But when you hit the bricks, and this is why I'm telling people, get the fuck out of America and go away so you can come back and really appreciate this country for what it is. <clears throat> you develop an inner resolve that carries forward in many different areas of your life. So many different areas of your life that it will make a difference. But when you are comfortable and you're whining and you're bitching and you're miserable, your perspective is just too narrow. It's too tight. Because when you've gone through shit, you can find joy on a happy, sunny, wonderful day. It's like, wow, the sun's out and life is good but if you are always complaining always looking at something negative you haven't had enough bad experiences to uh, shape your perspective and that's just my opinion someone's like gonna lose their mind no he said that right now my life sucks i'm living at home with my mama and dad i had breakfast this morning that mom made bitch see that kind of shit right there that just drives me crazy when you have those kind of resources that people will actually take you in, feed your musty ass, and you're still worthless, I don't really have a lot of respect for you. I really don't. Because I had an opportunity to go back home and live with my mom, and I said, hell no. Not doing that shit. Because another thing that happens is your habits define you. What you habitually do is what you will continue to do unless you kind of break, you know, behavior patterns. So understand in this new economy, going out to get more education to compete with other people who are going out to get more education. <laughs> you reach a point of diminishing returns and smaller paychecks. That's what's happening. Now, I'm able to figure this shit out. But there are people who, there's right now, people, someone you know, right now, they're online, they're filling out paperwork uh, for the student loans, they're doing all this stuff, and they're going to take that jump. They're going to get that degree. They're going to take time away from their family, which if it works out, is worth it. I will say that. And then four or five years later, like, what the fuck did I do? Because I'm not really making any headway. I am not, um, I'm not doing well. I can't figure this out. I have more education because the, indoctr the educational indoctrination complex says, if you have a degree, if you get more education, you should be okay. Reality, life is like, that shit's not true. Because... Come on, say it with me. Say it with me. Come on. Because there's too many people with degrees, so the value of having a degree for limited jobs in the United States of America makes a degree not a big qualifier. Some companies, you just need that to get in the door for a twenty dollars to $30,000 job. Why? Because they know there's so many of you out there. Understand that. It's not about fairness. It's not even about being evil. It's just like, hey, that's how the system is, and I can play that game very well. Why would you give someone a $100,000 salary when you can get that same person in the same job performance for 30? You own the company. Would you do that? It's like, I'm going to go out, and I'm going to give everybody. Everybody who works here is going to make a hundred grand, even if they are folding paper clips. Some people did that, and they're out of business now. <laughs> yeah they're out of business shit doesn't work uh, when I had my company and we went to my Latino brothers I saved so much money and the job performance was so much better it blew my mind you know here's another little tip for you say you have a, it's an online business and you go out and you hire VAs, and it's a process to that, it's a little tricky, it's not as straightforward as some people have you believe. Um, you don't pay any payroll taxes on that. No workers comp, 
no health insurance, nothing. So let's talk about that because we're talking about, you know, getting the fuck out of America, going global. This is a way you can bring global to you and save a lot of money because I had an assistant and she had to do something. So she had to quit. She recently contacted me again and I was like, I can't help you out because once you go VA, <laughs> you never go back. Um, just totally different experience, totally different experience. So understand, you can get someone in one of those emerging economies, and this is why I know that $50,000 a year in the Philippines is balling, because my VA was making three fifty dollars a month. For some, and this was a totally different project. That was mid-level income. If you pay a VA 600, 700 bucks a month, that's like doctor salary. Serious. It's like doctor salary. They can take care of their family and extended family on that. Yeah. So imagine if you're over there as an expat and you're making 50, 60, if you're making 100 grand, you are living like, like you're living like the mega wealthy on 100 G's. Mega wealthy. I'm talking about champagne service every night tips, whatever, and still be able to save money. So, it's like that in Brazil. Um, it's, I mean, when I went to Brazil, oh my God. I think I spent 200 bucks for the week that I was there. And was, yeah, 200 bucks. And, you know, I was a specialist E4 in the military at the time. I think I was making like <laughs> 750 bucks a month. I had never been able to live like that on that kind of money. I was just like, you got to be kidding me. You mean all this is only, wait a minute, all this is $2? For real? What's the tip? It's two, $2? Couldn't believe it. And I'm not talking about eating some bullshit either. I'm talking about eating well. I'm talking about eating, you know, the, the cow that grew up on the estate. Not that wild motherfucker. Not the one, not the cow in the jungle, but the uh, cultured cow. I mean, seriously, food was amazing. It was freaking amazing. And this is what happens when you get exposure. When you get a little bit of... Because see, in America, people tend to live in their community physically and mentally. To the point that if anything is introduced to that community that they don't understand, it's a threat. Even though it may not be a threat, it will be perceived as a threat. And treated as such. So... I understand. Hold on, let me make a little adjustment. You can, yeah, you'll be able to see it. Yeah, this is uh now it looks better than it used to because I'm seeing how houses have been remodeled. That one just been painted. But uh after I fell from uh, normalcy, which was a good thing because the chain run was affected, I ended up over here. And this is called the West End. Let's see. I haven't come this way in a long time. You know, to some people, it's like, this doesn't look this bad. Let me tell you, it's better looking now. <laughs> it's better looking. It's cleaner. And I haven't seen a crackhead. That's a little bit, a little bit better. It's cleaner, no crackheads. Um, and this was a time where drug dealers did hang out on the street corners. I don't think they do that anymore. I think everything's online, even, you know, getting your connect, so to speak. I mean, with a smartphone, you know, you probably got a drug dealer out there with a Facebook page. Come get your smackity smack, come get your lollipops, but, <clears throat> Yeah, gentrification is... Oh, that shit burnt down. But... And now, don't be deceived by some of these nicer houses. I've got a few friends that live over here. And the crime is freaking off the chain. I have a friend who refuses to buy another flat screen television. Even though I think the price of flat screens has come down so much. I don't know if they're still stealing them like they used to. Don't know what the deal is with that. 
this little janky china same little cafeteria it's been here forever uh, so I'm gonna take you to this is this no it's the next street over I'll take you around this uh, hood this hood because they spent some time in the hood let's see is he walking what is that no, I don't know what the hell that is. It's not a pit. He's too little. This is a uh, pit bull, uh, Rottweiler neighborhood. You may have some chicks with Yorkies. But this shit was crazy when I moved over here. It was fucking insane. As Kroger over here has been rat. I mean, that Kroger was so bad at the time. And they really cleaned it up because they had to. And you would walk in and you would smell the rancid meat. Yeah, I mean, seriously, um, it was deplorable at a high level. So let's see if we can make this turn and take you to what used to be the nightmare that I call my life. Okay, you're going to slow down and you two are going to speed up. Come on. Crackhead Galore used to be there all day, every day. Crackheads used to be here. Like, at this time of day, they would be here. Uh, let's see. Now, what's really sad is some of these houses are architecturally gorgeous and they were just allowed to fall into the sorry state because place I used to live in and in its prime in its heyday it was the shit but you know uh, not seeing a lot of difference not seeing too much of a difference here let's see well, some things have been fixed up yeah, I used to live on this street. And let's see. Yeah, you can't see it. I'm going to have to. Uh... Is anybody living there? Huh, there's a garden. All right. It used to be a house here, it burnt down. I lived here when it burnt down. I actually saw it on fire because I lived across the street. Let's see. And... Let's pull this out. You see that sucker right there? Uh, you know what? I'm just gonna have to disconnect. Alright, this is, uh, I don't know if it's still a boarding house, I'm not going to go knock on the door and mess with anybody, but right here, you see those two windows, I'll walk around, you can possibly see the door, the screen's still there, that room right there, with those two windows, I used to live in there, let me tell you something about that room, there's no fucking heat or air conditioning in there. <laughs> Because it used to be part of the porch. As you can see from where the brick stops and that's where it starts. It used to be part of the porch and they turned it into a room. And by the fact that there's a sheet up there, I'm going to say it's still a boarding house. And this house is experiencing something. Apparently a truck hit this. Huh? No. No, I used to live in that one. Oh, I thought you were facing this one up. Uh-uh. <laughs> Somebody is. Yeah, I thought you had some work for me. <laughs> you ain't got no work for me, do you? Yeah. Okay. Nope. And let's see. Fixing this up. Now look, what do you see up there? You see windows, you see one, two fans. So, 
I'm going to say chances of that being the boarding house are pretty high. Because you see the fans, and you see an air conditioning unit there. You see one up there. There used to be a family that lived in there. Now, back in the day, the guy that owned this house, he told me what he paid for. And this was a long time ago. He paid like 18 grand for this house. And if it was restored, because it's you know it's been split up, there's all kind of crazy stuff going on. But I would say the square footage of that house is about 4,800 square feet. So if it was like really fixed up, it's probably be like a half a million dollar house, even in this neighborhood because it's so big and some of the unique features. But uh, yeah, I used to live in that bitch. Just uh, kind of go around. And it looks better than it used to. Let me say it again. And I'll, I'm gonna get back in the vehicle and just drive around and show you. All right, so I'm gonna just, like I said, this is an improvement. This is an improvement. I'm gonna show you. house looks nice someone got shot over there now what's really interesting as a kid I didn't grow up in any shit like this I grew up poor but my people didn't look nothing like this nothing uh, houses were well maintained people cut their grass they were poor or you know average income but they had pride in the neighborhood. Let's see. As you notice, there's a lot of boarded up houses. Let's see. And everyone's looking at me weird and I've just figured out why. Because I'm driving this X5 and I'm looking at houses so they think I'm an investor. So because everybody's staring at me that I walk with looking like this. I don't fucking belong here. <laughs> I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, when I was moved over here, I was still working in the hospital for a few months. And, well, actually not the hospital, still in the medical field. I was working for LabCorp. And because I had to shave, you know, I shaved and everything, people thought I was a cop. I used to get that all the time. It's like, oh, you the popo. And then and people walk up to me. Wow, a lot of these houses are, um, oh, they fixed that one up. That's actually, uh, they're in the process of fixing that up. You see, now, you know, a lot of people are uh, talking about the economy and money is out here again. I am seeing, like, my neighborhood, houses are staying on the market 30 days, if that long people are dumping shit remember I said in the video about you know people not tr uh, dropping trash in their neighborhood that's not exactly the case over here oh that apartment used to be some oh you can't see damn like I said I have not been over here in this capacity in a long time but a lot of stuff's changed let's see Used to be a lot of craziness in this house. A lot of craziness on this side. A lot of these places are boarding houses again. There's a there's a high degree of vacancy around here. Extremely high. Now this place, I don't know if you can see, yeah, right there, that yellow place. I remember when the guy bought it, because it, it was like, it was a burnout. It didn't even have a ceiling on it. And I remember when they came in and fixed that, 
and turned it into, I think, four or five apartments. Now, he got it dirt cheap. Because I think at the time, I think he got it for like six or seven thousand bucks. I see five power meters, so it's five apartments. He probably spent maybe 20 grand total. And it's a long time ago. So he ain't making nothing but money. I am amazed at how many houses are freaking gone. Burn out. That house is gone. Huh. Well, yeah, this is what I fell into. Now, understand, this looks better <laughs> than it used to. This is better now. I want you to think of a uh, ass of a war zone. That's what this place used to look like. And it was weird because there would be like this really nice house. Then there would be madness. And it, it was just strange. Now, for some people, like, that shit ain't that bad. Because, you know, you're living in some bullshit right now. So it ain't that bad to you. But for me, you know, going from being poor to a you know, pretty good job, making decent money to falling into this shit that was worse than the neighborhood that I grew up in, it was a mind fuck. Now, I think what the people that live here, like if you're coming from New York or you coming from Chicago, this is a come up. Sad to say, but true. But for someone who had never had to deal with this shit, it is depressing and fuck. But kind of goes back to what I was talking about, you know, experiences. Um, that's enough touring of the, uh, this boy. Because it really hasn't changed. You know, it's cleaned up a little bit. All right, so. That's, Damn. A roof of this house is about to cave in. <laughs> Damn. All right. Let me get out of here before I become marginally depressed. Let's see. This would be the best way to get out of here. Now, this could be, and there's a pit bull. I knew it. Probably needed for family protection. But um, this could be a lovely neighborhood. It could be, but... The spirit of this neighborhood is one of all kind of madness. And I don't ever think it will go back to its former glory. Just don't think that's going to happen. Because there was an incredible amount of money put over here. It came up. It went back down. It's, uh, it's still crazy. It's very, very crazy. But... That is the crap that I used to live in. A room with no heat, nor air. I was there two years. And that's where I just got sick and tired of shit being the same and started making some better decisions. Because at night, gunfire, fights, sirens. Not all the time, but police helicopters i do remember there was this time we we're sitting in i can't i think dude's name was lamar was, we we're the only two that were home at the time and there was this bam 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 knock on the door and lamar go, gets up he goes to open up the door and it's the police and it's not just the friendly it's not officer friendly dude's got his gun drawn got his gun all up in lamar's grill and I automatically put my hands up and he looks and then another cop comes up and he's like, no, nah, that's not, neither one of them is him. And they just disappear. No, I'm sorry. None of that. None of that. Uh-uh. Nope. <laughs> just uh, be glad we didn't kill you. It was pretty much how that went down. Pretty much how that went down. Be glad we did not take you out. And that is the kind of crap that frequently happened over here. So, that place is gone. Now, I'll let you know, this is real close to the AU Center where Morehouse and Spelman is. I mean, a stone's throw. It's kind of sad, too.
Because I know some people come to Atlanta and like, what the hell? So, that is your tour of my life. Hopefully you got something out of it. Hopefully you understand where I'm coming from. I came from uh, circumstances not as good as many of you. So that's where I get my arrogance from. My uh, whatever lack of humility. And also, you know, even get a little deeper. I am not a typical black person in terms of the religion thing. That's not me. It never was. Even as a kid, I was never down with that because, in my opinion, that holds people back. Because it goes back to the father mother figure. You you need that you know to guide you versus you sitting down and actually thinking and coming up with solutions of your own. Because I got really pissed at someone. Two thousand nine, book came out, and they were like, you know, you should be. You should get on your knees and thank God for making that happen. And I was pissed. I was I was seriously pissed because I was like, God didn't have anything to do with this. And they were like, oh, it was, you know, it was one of those, like, that's what I mean. I don't talk to a lot of people about this because talking to certain black folks, you pretty much have uh, taken off your skin and become the devil in front of them by even saying that. Because this is another thing going on thoughts, concrete, critical thinking. If it was like that, and I'm not going to have the argument of why so many bad things happen in the world. I'm just going to have this. If you learn how a system works, teach yourself how the system works, learn the rules, learn how to operate in that system, you will yield results. And that's what I learned. And that's one of the reasons that I'm not on the, uh, the, the overly religious tip because you have some people they can't you know they pray in the morning and you know that's your thing that's your thing I'm just saying it's not mine and I don't know I don't know with uh, some black folks it's just like they haven't waken up like all that praying hasn't worked out you know you're praying to lose weight but you never will go for a walk <laughs> that shit cracks me up but I just never succumbed to that. And what really personified it for me was when I left that place back there, left that room, it was because I had a plan. I came up with a plan, came up with some steps. All of the steps didn't work out flawlessly, but 85% of it did. Got me out that hell hole. Got, I have not lived in some jacked up place like that since since that time period in my life. I've never, never gone into some bullshit like that again. And, you know, I was uh, reflecting the other day. It's like, wow. You left the storage auction business, started something completely new, and you support yourself. And that's, that's where the the confidence and the arrogance you know I'll call it arrogant hey is arrogant fine I don't care that's where it comes from because there are people who go through that kind of journey and they become drug addicted alcoholics or they commit suicide and you know I've known some people who didn't go through that journey and they really punked out on life you know I look at the resilience right up to the end that my partner showed and she was going through hell she was still caring about other people even though her every waking moment was full of pain so when you look at people and that's why I don't like whiners and people who complain and bitch like um, 2009 when I you know someone's like I answered two of their questions and then they kept asking me questions and I said buy the book and he put out in a forum, actually, Dan Dotson's Facebook page, and he's like, yeah, you ask Gundam because he tell you to buy the book, and then I'm like, the storage auctions business is not for weak little bitches, and that was my comment to him, because 
There are no magic jelly beans. There are there that that just drives me nuts. You have got to get it in your fucking head that your life is yours to make what you want out of it. It is your life. It's not my life. It's not your mother's life. It's not your father's life. It is your life to make out of it what you want, which takes a high level of responsibility, a high level of self-direction. And it's hard, but it's worth it. It is worth it because I ask you this question. How do you want to live your days? I mean, seriously, how do you want to live your days? Because you have choice in that matter. You have choice in that matter. All day long, every day, you have choice. The decisions you make today are going to affect your tomorrows. And hold on, I need to get away from these people who are driving like Miss Daisy but they look to be like 18 so ask yourself really ask yourself how do you want to live your days because after I got my that was my wake up wake up call back there you know that 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 was a wake up call bad bad things can happen to people who perceive themselves to be good it happens all the time so once I stop questioning why it happened and there was a period of self pity and there was a period of bitching and moaning and the longer that I did that the worse things got and it's just how it is so one day I just stopped doing it and started exploring what did I do to fuck up and once I isolated that I stopped making those kind of decisions now just because you stop making those kind of decisions does not mean that your life will turn around overnight it took months for me to start seeing the results of some of the decisions months not years you know so i think it was quick but that that is the thing because if you are in the united states of america right now understand if you can't figure this shit out here you can't figure it out nowhere else in the world because of so many resources that are just given to you youtube you don't even have to have a computer anymore. You can do all this shit on your phone and tablet. You understand how powerful that is? And many people just don't take advantage. They're uh, just like, hey, you know, um, I'm waiting on someone to come help me. I'm waiting on Superman, Spider-Man, Batman. I'm waiting for that Cape Crusader to come in my life and make everything okay to help me out to smooth my eels to make me feel better about myself keep waiting Superman ain't showing up Kryptonite took his ass out a long time ago and that that's the thing and that's what I talk about you know now black folks are not the only ones guilty of this needing the father the mother figure because you, you hear it all the time you know the spiritual father or my father at some point, you have got to fucking grow up and become the man or the woman. At some point, you have to. And some people, you can't do it. I know someone, I hope her parents make it a long time because she's going to be lost if something happens to them. And, and, you know, there's being close and there's being dependent. So it's just something for you to chew on, some things for you to think about. Hopefully you got some benefit from this video. Alright, this is Glendon Cameron and I will see you on the good side.